warm greetings to everybody who has joined in for today's uh, webinar. Um, and, and I'm very happy to be doing this topic, which is very close to my heart. Uh, please allow me to share the screen. So, so very, very quickly, before we go into the hardcore aspects of assessment of velopharyngeal uh, dysfunction, as a moderator, I'll just take up this thing of introducing the topic for anybody who is uh, fresh into the domain of cleft lip and palate. So what is velopharyngeal dysfunction? So velopharyngeal dysfunction is a condition wherein the velopharyngeal port does not function adequately during speech. Now, what do I mean by adequate function of the velopharyngeal port? Uh, so the velopharyngeal port basically comprises of the velum, the posterior pharyngeal wall and the lateral pharyngeal walls. And when a person is speaking, especially producing the oral pressure sensitive sounds, we want the velopharyngeal port to go and close against the posterior pharyngeal wall so that the sounds are directed through the oral cavity. So this is just a small video fluoroscopic clipping. I have purposefully muted this so, so that I can talk simultaneously, but you can just visualize here is where the velum sitting. And you can see the way the velum goes and raises against the posterior pharyngeal wall with a very beautiful knuckle going and touching against the posterior pharyngeal wall. So that pattern of closure is very, very essential. So in the case of velopharyngeal dysfunction, what we notice is this movement of the velum towards the posterior pharyngeal wall, making a complete contact with the posterior pharyngeal wall does not take place when the person is speaking and producing pressure sensitive sounds. So that's what we mean by velopharyngeal dysfunction. And um, so as I already told you, it's predominantly these three structures which are contributing the soft palate, which moves in the superior posterior direction, posterior pharyngeal wall, which appears to move anteriorly, and we have the lateral pharyngeal walls, which move medially to close against the velum. Now, why are we talking about velopharyngeal dysfunction in cleft? It's predominantly because of anatomical deviations to the velopharyngeal port. And uh, such kind of velopharyngeal dysfunctions are what we commonly hear as velopharyngeal inadequacy or velopharyngeal insufficiency, wherein following the repair of the palate because of a short velum or a grooved velum or because of structural deformities in the velum, the velum is unable to, or the velopharyngeal port is unable to do its job. So that's the concern that we face predominantly in individuals with cleft lip and palate, especially the isolated clefts. Sometimes, when cleft lip and palate is associated with syndromes and it is seen as part of a neuromuscular condition, because of physiological reasons, because of neuromuscular involvement, the velopharyngeal port might not function adequately. And this is what is referred to as velopharyngeal incompetence. And the third next factor is learning factors, wherein because the individual has learned maladaptations, the velopharyngeal port does not function for certain speech sounds alone. So while the velopharyngeal port may close for some speech sounds, it does not close across all the gamut of speech sounds, especially the pressure sensitive sounds. This is what we call as velopharyngeal mislearning, where we will find that velopharyngeal dysfunction is noticed only for certain phonemes. Usually in conditions with isolated cleft of lip and palate, we commonly come across velopharyngeal inadequacy uh, in, uh, or velopharyngeal mislearning. Now this is just, uh, it's not a very comprehensive review yet, but I just tried to pull out from the literature the different percentages of velopharyngeal dysfunctions that have been reported. There is a wide range that's reported starting right from 7.2% till 26% onwards. So this is just to emphasize, I'm not going to go into or probe into why these variations are noticed. That will be a whole webinar by itself. 
But this is just to emphasize the need for this topic. And I'm not surprised that many people have requested for a continuing education on a topic like this. So with this quick orientation, I will take you through the outline for today's webinar. To begin with, we will have Dr. Karun Agarwal talking to us about the clinical indicators of VPD for a surgeon. So what are the pointers during the assessment by a surgeon that helps us suspect velopharyngeal dysfunction? Followed by that, I would be talking about what are the indicators for a speech language pathologist? And then we would move into the direct assessment procedure. So meanwhile, uh, uh, thank you, Savita, for uh, introducing the topic so well and uh, kick, uh, kick start the session of today's uh, very important uh, uh, continuing medica medical education, which we have started um, uh, through our Smile Train uh, platform. This, uh, I must say, this is one of the important topics, which is very close to uh, my heart and I have been uh, thinking about it for past 40 years in whatever experience I have in plastic surgery. I am Dr. Karun Agrawal and a plastic surgeon from Delhi, India, because there are, I can see there are, uh, there is galaxy of uh, delegates from across the globe. And uh, uh, there will be different times in different time zones. However, here in India, it is coming to evening. So good evening, everybody. Now, so can coming you see to the, the yeah, now I am able to see the uh, yes, sir. Uh, slide there. Okay, now coming to this uh, today's topic of assessment of VPD, Dr. Savita has really introduced the word VPD, velopharyngeal dysfunction. I don't need to go to the detail why it is not VPI, VPD, because most of us used to call VPI earlier, but now we tend to use VPD. Now this has got three parts. One is the clinical evaluation, which most of the surgeons come across patients and then we tend to evaluate them clinically in our clinics. Second, we uh, have the perceptual evaluation, which is mostly done by SLPs or SL SLTs, as it is uh, called in different places. And third will be the instrumentation or objective and diagnostic uh, diagnostic procedures, which will commonly be nasendoscopy, video fluoroscopy, and nasometry. And there will be some indirect other methods which will be dealt with in due course of time. Next. Now, when we, as a clinician, as surgeon, when we sit in our clinic, we usually get uh, two, uh, two groups of patients who require uh, consideration for VPD correction. One is parents themselves bring, or uh, they themselves complain that uh, my child is not speaking well and there is some speech deformity. And second group of patients are those where they may, there may not be direct complaint from parents. However, we as uh, care, cleft care givers and SLPs during routine follow-up, we notice that there is some or other kind of speech abnormality these patients, especially the cleft palate operated earlier have. And these are the two groups of patients we come across clinically. Next please. Now in first group of uh, patients where the parents complain, invariably they will say that it is not understandable to themselves, to the parents as well, uh, to, uh, to the parents. There will be some of them who will say that parents, uh, we, as parents, we are able to understand, but the peers and the neighbors and other relations, they are not able to understand the, uh, the speech of the child. Some of the children have to repeat again and again in school, during viva, during examination, during a conversation, uh, to make the peer understand what they are talking about. Some of them, they may understand, but it will not be so intelligible in their speech. And quite a few of them come with the complaint of uh, bullying by the peers and friends when the speech is poor. So these are the usual patients we come across in post cleft palate repair and uh, in follow-up, and they come with complaints of uh, speech abnormality requiring assessment. 
no there will be two group uh, second group as i said will be noticed by us when we do the assessment procedures after uh, three four years of age whenever we want to assess the speech uh, objectively as well as subjectively next please next yeah so as clinician when uh, any of these patients come to our clinic as uh, most of our uh, examination pattern goes we take the history and then we go for the examination so here again we have got two parts one is the history and in history what is important is we must exclude the non cleft causes which uh, can cause speech abnormality then we as a clinician i tend to keep talking to them keep talking to children and the parents when they come to the clinic and i tend to ask what is the age of the uh, child when the surgery was done who did it and as far as possible i like to see the document which will tell me that uh, was it done at the right time uh, was it done by the right person and what uh, is the technique the person uh, the surgeon has used another important part which i tend to ask is the nasal regurgitation is it there or not if it is there it is only the liquid or the solid and the quantity of the regurgitation this will tell about if there is a fistula or not if fistula is there what is the size of the fistula if it is too small then only the liquid will come out if it is uh, significantly large then the solid will come out going back to the examination itself um, i think uh, karun had uh, talked about the lips and the dental occlusion so one of the things that you need to be very careful about is the uh, is the influence of the teeth because sometimes you might mistake air escaping out as hypernasality i have done that on occasion and uh, corrected by my speech language pathologist uh, the shape of the palate whether whether uh, the previous repair has produced a, a palate that is intact so in more times than not even if a person has a velopharyngeal dysfunction the palate will appear intact the repair appears reasonably good the problem is the function or the movement of the palate visible scars might give you an idea this is something that i have learnt operating on secondary palates over the years that often times one of the reasons why um, even a good repair does not uh, uh, cause good closure is because the palate had scarred and the scarring would have been due to various reasons including paucity of tissues uh, tension during closure and an, an infection that caused uh secondary healing and so on and so forth and that's why it was important uh, uh, what uh, professor agarwal mentioned that he wants to look at the history of the surgery length of the palate this is something that used to be very very important considered as very important often time diagnosis of velopharyngeal dysfunction was made based on the um, length of the palate a short palate is always clinically seen palate which was short intra orally Uh, was assumed to be having a velopharyngeal dysfunctions beware this could be a red herring you might have a normally functioning palate even if it appears short and vice versa a palate that appears good in length may not have the adequate muscular contracture to go back and close against the velopharyngeal competence so these are very very crude indicators but the next one is important the mobility of the palate this is something that we consistently do to every one of our patient say ah and when you see if you see good movement of the soft palate ask the child to say ah when you see inside the mouth if you see a good mobility more often than not the function is going to be good but remember this is not this is just a preliminary look at the, a problem and not definitive uh, definitive um, uh, findings uh, can we go to the next one please so you ask the child to speak like i said uh, sometimes parents say oh there's no problem with the speech and you 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 ask the child to say a few words and you know there is a significant problem and i've explained to you why it could happen it's not that the parents are lying and the next one please so these are the standard things that you would do uh, with the child in the in the form of a conversation rather than uh, trying to uh, examine the child speaking about various 
things like what is mentioned on this slide would give a very good idea to you of whether this speech is intelligible. End of the day, we might talk about perceptual speech assessment. We might talk about endoscopy and fluoroscopy, etc., which we are going to do today. But end of the day, the bottom line is the intelligibility of the speech. What they now have divided as understandability and acceptability of speech. That's what matters. You know, if if I can, un if any stranger can understand every single word of what. Uh, the, the child can say, but with some nasal air emission, functionally, uh, you, 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 you would consider that as, that as a mild problem, at least for me. Whereas somebody who has a, a, a reasonable degree of movement of the soft palate, but most of the words are not understandable, has a more significant issue. So by, by talking about uh, uh, various things to the child, you will not only be able to assess the speech sample, but also find out um, uh, uh, the, the intellectual capabilities, for example, of the child. Next slide, please. So you can ask them to, uh, uh, as you talk to them, sorry, now this is, uh, can we play the audio? So now this is what you would hear, uh, yeah, if there is a dysfunction. Uh, so, so basically here, what we're doing is we're moving from a connected speech to a specific speech sample, which is including rote speech sample, which the child is very familiar with and can say without thinking much. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So, so can we go on to the next one? So here, uh, like I was mentioning to you, the intelligibility of the speech is reasonably good, uh, but you can see that there is hypernasality of speech. Savita, can we go to the next one? Play that, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sixteen, seventeen, seventeen, eighteen, eighteen. 19, 19, 20, 20, 20 16, uh, I think we move on to the next one. So, yeah. so in this slide, you are seeing that uh, the words are not very intelligible. There is hypernasality and there are various other distortions which Savita will later on speak to us. So basically, uh, by, by making the child do this in the clinic, you are already getting an idea whether there's a problem, if so, whether it is mild or severe. Next slide, please. Right. So that's what Karun had written. So when you do this, you will find out whether, whether there is an abnormality and in your grading, you know, just, just as a ballpark figure, is it, is it bad? Is it good? Is it mild, etc. That's, that's what it will give you an idea before you pass on the child to the uh, speech and language pathologist. Next slide, please. So, like I said, uh, we are just doing this preliminary assessment. Uh, for us to uh, uh, get an impression of whether the child has a problem, if so, uh, what, what kind of problem it might be. But when we want to uh, uh, get a clearer idea of what the problem is and what the solution should be, uh, our SLP colleagues come in and uh, now Dr. Savita will come over and uh, tell us in greater detail how she would do her assessments. Over to you, uh, Savita. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti, for stepping in there. Uh, now, uh, so when the patient comes or gets referred to a speech language pathologist, what is it that we do? And what, is, uh, what, what, is, uh, what are the indicators that a speech language pathologist looks out for while assessing a patient with velopharyngeal dysfunction? So the, there are a whole range of speech indicators for velopharyngeal dysfunction. I will, I will go through each one of these uh, one by one. But, but before we go into identifying this, one of the, one of the key procedure that a speech language pathologist does is the perceptual assessment. Uh, well, the perceptual assessment might sound something very low key without infrastructure, without use of much hi-fi or high technology based equipment. But uh, as a speech language pathologist, I would say, there can be no tool more precious than the speech language pathologist's ear, especially a trained ear of the speech language pathologist is very, very important. Because a properly done perceptual assessment will give us several indicators and give us a lot of subtle points which cannot be obtained by any other instrumental procedure. So that's why we say the key thing to a speech language pathologist or the key area that a speech language pathologist should invest once they are into cleft speech language pathology is training for perceptual assessment. It's almost like a process of calibrating your ears to be able to identify some of the different error patterns. So what do we look for when we are looking at velopharyngeal dysfunction? Usually, we would see a combination of the symptoms that I have listed out here. There will be a combination of at least two or more of these symptoms, including hypernasality, nasal air emissions during production of oral consonant, facial or nasal grimaces, weak pressure consonants, and sometimes there will also be presence of compensatory articulatory errors. Now we will go into each of these one by one. The signature characteristic for velopharyngeal dysfunction is hypernasality. Sometimes you may find hypernasality along with hyponasality if there is anything that is causing an occlusion in the tract like tonsillitis, for instance. But predominantly what we notice is hypernasality. Now, what is hypernasality and why do we see hypernasality when there is velopharyngeal dysfunction? So what is happening is when there is velopharyngeal dysfunction, the air, instead of coming out through the oral cavity, comes out through the nasal cavity. Now, all of us know that the physical properties of the oral and the nasal cavity are different. So sound is traveling through a different cavity, which is different in terms of size. It is different in terms of the cellular properties as well. So the absorption of energy by these two cavities are very different. So all of us again know when sound travels through cavities of different volume and different properties, the quality of the sound that comes out differs. So hypernasality is attributed to that quality because of sound traveling through the nasal cavity. So because the velopharyngeal port is not able to go up and close against the posterior pharyngeal wall because the velum is not able to do that, air is escaping through the nasal cavity. And so the property of the energy that is coming out of the nasal cavity sounds very different. So the resonance of that sound is different from what it happens when it comes through the oral cavity. So that is what contributes to hypernasality, which is basically a quality related phenomenon. So this is how a speech with hypernasality sounds. So I've, I'm presenting a speech which has exclusive hypernasality or predominant hypernasality so that you can hear and tune yourself to identifying this phenomenon. Maman Magal Meena. Maman Magal Meena. Leela Pal Kudital. Leela Pal Kudital. Tina Tumblare Portal. Tina Tumblare Portal. Yar Valayal Wangiadu. Yar Valayal Wangiadu. Rangan Railil Yerinan. Rangan Railil Yerinan. Sami Kasa Satan. Sami Kasa Satan. Kamini Paka Kudu. Kamini Paka Kudu. So these are sentences which are repeated in the Tamil language. For a trained ear, language should technically not be a barrier in perceiving hypernasality. 
So here we know the sounds are produced in an appropriate manner, but the quality of the sound or the resonance of the sound is different. And it sounds as though the voice has got a nasal twang to it. That is what we mean by hypernasality, which is a signature characteristic that we notice in individuals with velopharyngeal dysfunction. The next common phenomenon that we notice when there is velopharyngeal dysfunction is the presence of nasal air emissions or nasal turbulence, as it may be called, during the production of oral consonants. And this may be accompanied along with grimacing around the nostril. Now, what do we mean by nasal air emission? Very often times I see um, surgeons, sometimes even speech language pathologists, especially those who are in the beginning of their careers, get confused between hypernasality and nasal air emission. While hypernasality is a phenomenon related to the energy of the air, nasal air emission is a phenomenon that we hear because of perceivable air flow. So you perceive the air flowing through the cavity. That is what is called nasal air emission. So when we are producing oral consonants, like for example, let me take the sound pa pa. So pa pa is a sound where there is no sound that air escapes or air escapes through the nose. It's all through the mouth and it is only pa pa. But now if I'm going to produce this pa pa with a nasal air emission, it's going to sound as ha ha. You can hear that where the air is escaping through the nasal cavity. So that is where it is called as nasal air emission. So it could be or so those are where the sound is produced along with the nasal air emission. Now nasal air emission can exist with or without hypernasality. Now let's listen to this person with cleft of lip and palate producing this sound. For counting. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. 90 to 99. 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, so those are the nasal air emissions that could be perceived, especially on the pressure sounds like the ters, the sirs, all were coming out with nasal air emission. Then the next phenomenon that we see is uh, weak pressure consonants, where the sound is not really escaping through the nasal cavity, but even when it is just produced in the oral cavity, it does not have the required strength. It does not have the required intraoral breath pressure because of which it sounds weak. Now here is a child producing weak pressure consonants. Uh, the pressure consonants are sounds like the p, t, k, t, s, with any vowel combinations. Papi, papi. Papi, 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 papi. Kaki, 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 kaki. Hati, hati, hati. Tati, tati, tati. Ati, ati, ati. Sasi, sasi, sasi. Tati, tati, tati. Shashi, shashi, shashi. Tati, tati. Acha. Abhi mein jo bolungi, wo aap aapas bolna hai aapko. Chhi. Papu, papita, pakdo. Papu, papita, pakdo. Bahar barish hui. Bahar barish hui. Dadi dood de do. Dadi dood de do. Tikku ka TV tuta. Tikku ka TV tuta. Papi, papi. I'll stop that here for want of time. 
So, so you can see in this particular video sample that I played, there wasn't much sound coming from the nasal uh, cavity as such. There was no perceivable air escape from the nasal cavity, but there were a lot of articulatory errors and the productions were also not produced with the required intraoral breath pressure. It sounded as though he did not have the energy to produce the oral sound appropriately. So usually we see a combination of these symptoms. So now here is a child whom I'm going to play whose sample has got almost all of these characteristics. And if we see a child like this, you can be very sure that there is definite velopharyngeal dysfunction. Uh, this is the sample here. Where are you from? Where are you from? Through a tree. Where are you from? I'm from a tree. Where are you from? I'm from a tree. Where are you from? First standard. Who are you from? I'm from a தலையாட்டம் சொல்லு சரியா பட்டக்க 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 சொல்லு so so i hope you were able to appreciate all of these symptoms in that even if you do not know this language you can say that there was a lot of nasal twang in the speech there were sounds escaping from the nasal cavity there were beautiful grimacing around his nostrils and there were articulatory errors production errors as well so such these are the ones that we look for velopharyngeal dysfunction now while we train our ears to identify, another important aspect when we are talking of perceptual assessment is what is the kind of sample that is elicited? When we are talking of velopharyngeal dysfunction, it's always important to use connected speech or sentences which are loaded with pressure consonants in order to complete the assessment. Resonance should never be assessed exclusively just using single word repetition task. You always have a connected speech as well when you're looking at assessment of resonance. Uh, and once we have an impression of VPD, we have to go ahead with the next step wherein we have to view the velopharynx using either endoscopy or video fluoroscopy. And based on the findings of that, we decide for further management. Uh, so with that, I will stop here and we can take any questions for uh, discussions on clinical impression of velopharyngeal dysfunction. Uh, Madam, I'm Vishal Mehra from Jabalpur. I have a very simple question. As you said yes, that uh, we can assess, uh, how do we differentiate, uh, how, do we, uh, how will we assess perceptual hyponasal voice uh, versus a perceptual hypernasal voice? A hyponasal and a hypernasal sounds like yeah. a, a hypernasal is a voice which is characterized by an increase in the nasal quality for, yes, an, yes. Oral sound, for an oral sound. So if you, have, uh, if you have, if you take sounds like the p, t, k, ch, s, sh, you will perceive that they are sounding like sounds which are coming out with a nasal twang. So there is right. an increase in the nasality you perceive on the oral sounds. That is hypernasality. Right. Now, hyponasality, on the other hand, is something that you perceive on your nasal sounds. So when you take the nasal sounds like your m, n, n, now these sounds, sounds denasalized. It's like, you know, what happens when you have a blocked nose and you're trying to speak with a blocked nose, how your speech sounds. So your nasal sounds sounds like that. Now that is what is perceived as hyponasality. Okay. So uh, how will we uh, perceptually assess these, uh, this hyponasal sound uh, in uh, cases of CV-CV combination? CV-CV combination is papa, or yeah. mama. 
so if i am suspecting hypernasality i will use sounds like papa or maybe papi you can use both of these are cv cv combinations so you right. can do pa papi 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 tati 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 kaki 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 and here whether there is a nasal twang to it if you're hearing an increased nasal twang when you're doing these that will be called as perceptual hypernasality and right. if you do mommy 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 nani 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 and if that sounds denasal like sometimes right. it's so so that you hear your mommy mommy as babbi babbi and your nani nani as daddy daddy it sometimes right. goes that denasal now that will be considered as hyponasality right right so do we have a list of uh, uh, consonant vowel combination words or syllables where we can differentiate uh, or make the child to uh, pronounce those words to differentiate hypernasal and hyponasality we generally use sentences we do not recommend using words because resonance as i told you is best assessed in connected speech so there are sentences available in different languages for that purpose yes okay 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 yeah right, right. Uh, thank you so much ma'am yeah thank you there's another question by what average age is bpd adequately assessed um we've done it for children as young as 5 years onwards the difficulty is if they have sufficient language we can take them in for vpd assessment if they have language where they are able to speak at least two to three word combinations they can be taken up for vpd assessment but the challenge is in the following part the perceptual assessment is the easiest part there the following part where we'll be talking about visualization we feel we need a patient who will be compliant even for visualization once they are compliant for visualization then we can do it for children as young as 5 years uh, i know there are centers abroad where they have done even for younger ages uh, it's about having the child cooperate for the procedures but technically what we see is does a child have sufficient language development in order or does she have he or she have sufficient words to be speaking in connected speech so that we can assess resonance uh gunjan i hope that question was answered uh what is the meaning of a nasal snot a nasal snot is and uh, normally we all produce speech on um expiratory air a nasal snot is a phenomenon where you have a nasal sound quality on an inspiratory air so they do something like so if they have to say pa 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 ta pa da which is completely on expiration they may do you may you may hear that inspiratory nasal air escape coming in in between that's called nasal snot the the next uh, the next one is uh, cul-de-sac resonance cul-de-sac resonance is again a terminology that is used to indicate a muffled speech which is occurring because of a combination of hyper and hyponasality so now let's say a person has velopharyngeal dysfunction so in the in the presence of velopharyngeal dysfunction air is escaping into the nasal cavity but let us say the person also has a deviated nasal septum or a nasal polyp because of which there is an obstruction in the nasal cavity this sound kind of keeps echoing within the nasal chamber so that results in a muffled speech that's called the cul-de-sac resonance uh, i'm not very good at producing a cul-de-sac resonance but but that almost sounds like you know the common phrase that we use is potato in the mouth speech it sounds like you're speaking with a huge potato blocking the air from coming out of the thing and the sound keeps resonating within the uh, nasal cavity uh fine uh, there are more questions coming up but i will keep this for a later point of time for want of time i will go ahead with the next uh, topic so after now that we finished with clinical indicators the next one is visualization and uh, may i request uh, Dr. Mukund Reddy to start his talk on uh, flexible nasal endoscopy. Hello, everyone. It's uh, it's good to be talking to you through this uh, through this platform. 
So it's about basic necessities that you are here. And uh, I believe uh, when I was changing, the video went live. <laughs> so apologize for that. So when we, anyway, we start with basic necessities. And uh, I take this opportunity to welcome all of you for this webinar. And one of the basic things that is required when assessing VPD is an objective assessment using an S endoscope, which is probably the simplest because it doesn't really require X-ray equipment or a video fluoroscope or preferably a, a digital uh, uh, system based on a CT platform, which gives an excellent uh, video fluoroscopic images. But then the simplest is to use an endoscope which uh, even if we don't personally own one, I'm sure ENT colleague or one of the specialists will help you out in doing an endoscope. And uh, currently it is a must from uh, Smile Train to upload either endoscope or video fluoroscope for you to be able to do surgeries on a patient with VPD. And it's also important, and when we'll discuss about it subsequently. So I'll share a small this video, if you can see this, it, it starts with local anesthetic, which most of us use when doing a, a, a nurse endoscopy. And ideally, a spray of 10 to 15 percent lox or xylocaine or lidocaine uh, is, uh, is good because it produces uh, less discomfort to the patient, in my opinion, than using a 4 percent or 2 percent xylocaine, uh, which is, can be instilled through a syringe into the nostril. So I'm sure most centers would have at least xylocaine drops, which can be instilled. Because there is a third method which we can do. While preparing for this talk, I wanted to do a video of how to do an endoscope. And because of the COVID times, I thought it's best to subject myself to an endoscope. I asked my uh, colleague Sohail, who worked with me for a number of years, this is sister demonstrating that you could use a spray or the installation through the syringe. And a few words about the equipment that, that I have. This is the stars and the one is the light source, which is connected through this cable to the endoscope. And next is the console uh, to which the endoscope is connected. And from the console, this wire leads to the monitor. So while doing this, you have to record as well because recording of the speech along with the endoscopy is helpful in analysis of your colleague. And this is the, this is my colleague uh, uh, Sohail showing how to hold the endoscope. It is usually the scope is rested on the forearm and then the other hand uses uh, it to negotiate so that it can be passed into the patient. This is how it is handled. And this is the light source and that is the outlet which goes to the, uh, it goes across the hand so that this remains stable on the forearm. Now he will demonstrate how to do it on me. This is real time, and then it is an unedited video. Now, I'm having a better view. 
since we have used the spawn, we will start with the speech part of the endoscopy. So, first is the conversation. So, what is your name? Kundari B. Can you tell me your place of residence? Rajava Hills. So, we will start with the word repetition. Bus. Bus. Bit. Wind. Thief. Thief. Dem. Dem. You can see from this that it's such a simple thing to do. And then it's a question of doing it because I have learned it and then I taught my colleague to do it. And he has done hundreds of them. So I have confidence. You can see the confidence. Of course, he said, your nose is big and your pharynx is big. <laughs> so you have a loud mouth, so you can pass it easily. So that is understandable because it's a little more difficult in a patient with a more deviated septum than I have to pass this endoscope. But with a little bit of patience, it's like a, a pilot clocking uh, flying hours before he gets a license to fly. If you keep doing maybe 10 cases, maybe 20 cases, you will become an expert. And it takes only a few minutes to do it. In my clinic, uh, for example, we don't give appointment to the patient to do endoscopy uh, a week later. We do it then and there. Normally, I would see the patient in the OPD go up uh, to the OR to do something and come down. By the time the speech pathologist or the sisters, they would have uh, uh, done the endoscope. And it is a matter of few minutes. For the patient, it's much more comfortable to do it that way. And I have to... Actually, what I did was I asked them to put the spray in one nostril and with the syringe in the other nostril so that I wanted to assess what, which is uh, more comfortable to the patient, in this case, to me. I found that it's, taking a spray is easier. Though I had uh, one trouble in this I would like to mention. While taking a spray, if you are inhaling uh, deeply, what happens is it goes into the throat and I had difficulty in swallowing for some minutes, which can be very disconcerting. So when you are using a spray for as an anesthetic, please do not ask the patient to deep, take a deep breath. The other one using a syringe actually dribbles through the nose outside. So it is less of a less comfortable while instilling. But I have to say, I had the endoscope done for the both nostrils. I would like you to see him do it for, through the other nostril. Page, page, 69, 70. It was not difficult at all. Thank you. So then he, he did for the other nose. Other nostril, sorry. Only one point of resistance is at the time of tur turbinates. Once you are through the turbinates, you are directly onto the soft palate, which is here. Then you can ask the patient to uh, immediately say this. One trick in this is in our, every patient, we need to do a pre-op recording of the speech. If you use the same uh, template or the word stimuli in the pre-op and the post-op, it becomes much easier. The ch child or the little older individual you are doing, the youngest we have done is around five years, like Savita has mentioned earlier. As they grow older, it becomes easier. Uh, so when you use a template and use the same words to, as a repetition, when you do the endoscope, it becomes easier because patient knows what to expect. Once you finish with the endoscopy, the, after it is removed, the next thing is how to sterilize this. So immediately it is kept on a sterile paper, then it's cleaned with 
a betadine solution or povidone iodine. It's available everywhere. So sister cleans it gently this way, but that's not sufficient in the COVID scenario. So it is sent for uh, sterilization again. It takes half an hour for this to go through something called plasma sterilizer. This is a machine which our Sterad uh, company, which our uh, hospital uses. I believe they utilize uh, hydrogen peroxide as one of the uh, re reagents to sterilize this so, so that uh, we, we can sterilize it properly. And approximately half an hour is required for sterilizing the instrument. This is about NAS endoscopy. It is as simple as that. You just pass the uh, soft scope with it slightly flex flexing so that it goes through the soft palate. Then once you visualize, quickly, quickly give the uh, stimulus that you want to see. You don't need to record the whole thing like we did for the soft, uh, for a speech uh, recording. For example, this is a speech recording. We, it has a reasonable length of... It goes on uh, with uh, words and then uh, followed by uh, count from 60 to 70. I would request uh, uh, Savita to comment on the speech sample that we have just seen. Savita, can you make a few comments before we go on to endoscopy? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so basically, um, now, now if we, we have to see for a, a complete perceptual assessment, what we need is, as uh, Dr. Reddy already mentioned, we need a combination of samples. Like it has to include multiple tasks of repetition across different levels. So we use word syllables to begin with, which is what I was telling you, papi, papi. Uh, then we use uh, resonance. For resonance, we use connected, um, I'm sorry, we use words for looking at sound production or articulation. Then we look at sentences to see for uh, connected speech level. In addition to these, we also use a rote speech task so that the person is just asked to do the counting. 60 to 70 is useful only if the person can count in English. Those are words that are included in because it's loaded with pressure consonant. It's got the sir and the ter coming in frequently. That is the reason why we use this. Now, um, uh, this uh, speech sample uh, definitely has mild levels of hypernasality. And there are also some articulatory errors which are present in this sample. Um, I've not heard the entire thing, so I'm not uh, kind of describing the articulatory errors, but yes, this child does have a combination of both articulation as well as hypernasal resonance. Okay, thanks, Sarita. This is the uh, picture of the palate of this child. This child, I myself have operated when seven years before the UPD assessment and surgery was been, has been performed. This was in, done in 2014. I have selected uh, three or four patients where I can give the voice sample, the picture of the uh, palate, the uh, NAS endoscopic findings, the what decision was made, and the subsequent webinar which you are planning about uh, management, I'll be able to probably show the same patients about the post-op endoscopy and the voice sample. So that will complete the picture. Right now, if you, what I would like to point out is if you look from here, the length of the palate is not too short, but it's still short. At that time, I used to do a, a, a radical dissection and a straight line closure. We did an endoscopy on this, and these are the findings. 
on endoscope. There are two things I would like to ind indicate here. One is the passivant ridge, which you see prominently in the posterior wall, is you usually not seen in a normal uh, individual. Whether you see in a video fluoroscopy or endoscopy, passivant ridge is a presumptive indicator that the patient does have an EVPD. Here, you see the palate has a good ridge of uh, soft palate muzzle, which is moving almost, but not actually touching. So there is a small gap. This is quantified as a small gap. So we can have a couple of more examples to show other gaps. This is a voice sample of a similar one, not too bad. That's the palette, how it looks. It's not too short. This is the findings on endoscopy. You can see it's the adenoidal hypertrophy, and then it almost touches, but there is bubbling. So these are palettes where the VPD is not really severe. There is a small gap, but then small gap is enough to spoil the normal speech. In fact, even there is a touch closure with bubbling, like in this patient, can also produce a speech which is abnormal. If, a, if somebody claims that they can do this with speech therapy, then uh, I would be very skeptical about this because therapy does not correct an organic dysfunction. Dysfunction is where the sphincter is unable to close. So even if it's a small or a big one, it is the same because there it will require surgery. Then why do you do endoscopy is to document how much is the gap because looking in the mouth, you can't really say you can, I can give you another example of this child. You look at the palate in the mouth, you can never, never make out. There is a nasal grimaces, slight hypernasality. This is the palate. You see, this is shorter. This is quite short. But the gap, there is a central small gap. This is bigger. The gap is slightly more than what we had shown earlier in the two cases. This is a central small gap. There is a reasonably good movement of the lateral wall and this. And there is no more of movement from the posterior pharynx. It doesn't move. Next is a little more severe case. This one, you listen to this speech. Chapati, Chetilo, Undi, 
Stop for a minute. We'll just. I would request Savita to comment on this page. This is a, as bad as it can get. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, the the predominant uh, symptom that stands out in this speech is the compensatory articulatory error. She has a lot of glottal productions. Most of the sounds are getting backed to glottals, and uh, along with that, there is also presence of hypernasality, maybe moderate degree hypernasality. And um, grimacings are present, um, intermittent nasal air emission. I think she's also another one patient where, you know, all those symptoms that we list for uh, velopharyngeal dysfunction is uh, present in her. But the characteristic that stands out is the glottal productions. Okay, thanks, Savita. No, they are predominantly glottal. And uh, Pamplona from... Uh, 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 Mexico. She, she did a workshop saying that time spe specifically mentioned that glottal should be corrected before you actually operate because then you can assess a little better because those who are predominantly glottal speech do not use the palate. Do you agree uh, on that principle, Savita? Um, so we do give them a trial of speech therapy at least for the bilabials or anything. So what happens is we will not be able to correct the productions completely, but the productions may be moved towards a weak pressure consonant or a pressure consonant produced with nasal air emission. It is not because there is structural inadequacy there. It is not possible to completely correct the misarticulations there. But we may just change the nature of misarticulation to be sure that the person is indeed using the velopharyngeal port. And it is not a case where the person is not attempting to use the velopharyngeal port at all. So, so what happens is we may bring, we may avoid the glottal constriction for just limited speech sound, but it gets substituted with nasal air emissions. Okay, thank you. These are the findings. You can see the sound being produced in the vocal card. <laughs> One of our speech therapy colleagues with me in a workshop specifically said you have to go down and visualize the vocal cards when you do the endoscope because you can then know if there is an abnormality in the vocal card like nodules. Here there is, a, there is an indication of small nodular uh, things which I am not sure an ENT colleague has to comment on this. So, but then uh, you, can, you can visualize how it works uh, in a glottal speech. <laughs> I think uh, we'll stop at that. I have some more examples, but they can wait. Thanks, Savita. Sure. Uh, thank you, sir. So there's just one question that you may quickly answer. What is the size of the nasoendoscope used? Yeah, it is 2.6 to 3 millimeters, what I use. I think it's 3 millimeters. So the currently, smaller ones are available. That's what yeah. I use. Okay. Uh, th thank you, sir. We will take more questions uh, after we finish uh, rigid endoscopy as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move forward to the next part of the webinar now, where we will be looking at uh, how rigid endoscopes can be used for this same process. Uh, may I request Dr. Karun, please? Yeah. Uh, Savita, I am sorry for the previous glitches. Oh, 
this time it works well. Uh, now, coming to the endoscopy, Dr. Mukund has already covered extensively uh, about the uh, role of endoscope and uh, how it has to be assessed. What uh, I am uh, trying to uh, present here is the uh, rigid uh, nasendoscope because most of uh, the people who are using nasendoscopy they use the flexible. It's a most popular uh, nasendoscope uh, at present. But I tend to use rigid endos uh, endoscope wherever it is possible. And uh, along with nasendoscope, uh, this uh, while doing the nasendoscopy, I always record the video and audio together simultaneously through the computer interface. That is very important because the, unless you have got the video recording, we cannot go ahead again and again and uh, visualize it. So that is very important for us to recapitulate and uh, reassess again and again uh, in the post-operative period and follow up as well. Now, most of the time, Next, the, most of the time, the people who uh, come for the uh, training or uh, when, they, when we present this, the commonest question asked is how difficult it is. Now, nasendoscopy is very simple as Dr. Mukund presented. It's very easy. You have to go only 10 centimeters inside the nose and you can uh, visualize it. But it requires a practice. It requires little experience. It has got a short learning curve. And once we start doing it, it should be possible to do regularly for children as small as four years and five years of age. And there should not be any problem in uh, uh, performing the nasendoscopy. I'll come to the difference between uh, rigid and the difficulty of the rigid in due course of time. Next, please. The no, previous one. Yeah, these are the, uh, this is the image of a rigid endoscope as well as the flexible. The flexible is usually what we use the pediatric uh, nasopharyngoscope, which is around 30 centimeter in length. And it has got 2.3 to 2.7 millimeter external diameter. That 2.3 to 2.7 varies between the companies. But the speciality of uh, flexible endoscope is you will have a marker at six o'clock position on the screen. The rigid endoscopes, what we are supposed to use for nasoendoscopy is of 70 degree bevel at the tip. And uh, I have, I tend to use uh, two of them. One is the pediatric one, which is 2.3 millimeter in external diameter. The adult one is 4.2 millimeter, but there is a usual variation between the companies of a couple of millimeters here and there. But this is a usual 2.3 and 4.2 is the external diameter. See, the tip of the zero has got a, a very, I mean, uh, whereas uh, 70 degree has got a bevel edge and it's got a clear cut, uh, cut edge on the yes, zero. Bevel edge, bevel edge of 70 degree. And you that is the guillotine of, kind uh, of uh, end on. So this is the flexible one. So the patient is sitting in front of me. See, okay, just one minute. You can see the palate coming nicely in uh, approximation of the posterior pharyngeal wall. So you can see the marker is at the six o'clock position, which indicates the palatal sign. Yes, that is the indicator or the marker of the six o'clock so position the of the interior compared with the rigid scope. Here the palate is in front because the bundle size is only only two point seven millimeter. So you can appreciate the eustachian tube a little bit at 9 o'clock position and that's a 3 o'clock position that's the septal side and that's about the nest pharynx and then say ah, uh, Minim uh, okay, then Ramakrishnan. Ramakrishnan. Yes. Now you can see the difference between the rigid and flexible. This is the picture with the rigid endoscope of uh, uh, 4.2 millimeter dimension. So you can see the clarity of vision with the uh, rigid endoscope. That's why it is, uh, I prefer to use rigid endoscope wherever it is possible. Next, please. Now, this, uh, uh, this video is a short video, one and a half minutes. This shows how the procedure is performed when we use the rigid endoscope. Previous one uh, showed the flexible one. This is, we hold it like a gun and uh, the port, the light, 
cable remains at the top at the 12 o'clock position and this is the monitor and the system of the nasoendoscopy projection patient sits in front of you and the laptop uh, is monitored by somebody else to simultaneously record audio and video through the interface this is what is important before we do endoscopy is counseling of the child and uh, taking care of their comfort they should become very friendly by the time you insert the nasal endoscope and they should have confidence in you so that's why i keep talking to them i keep joking and i keep uh, talking to them uh, throughout the period of endoscopy and you can see the uh, rigid endoscope once it is inserted it is easily it goes there and it sits right over the pharynx without any manipulation because it has got that 70 degree pre-rising two three four five six seven eight nine seven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one sixty Sixty. Sixty-one. Sixty-two. Sixty-three. Sixty-four. Sixty-five. Sixty-six. Sixty-seven. Sixty-eight. Sixty-nine. Seventy. Okay. So when we do the recording of the endoscopy picture, the child should be as comfortable as possible. Then only you can have very good speech recording along with the nasal endoscopy. So, if the child is comfortable, we uh, normally have one twenty to start the procedure. Then sixty to seventy, as Dr. Savita said, that that's the one which you will like to assess because of the plosive sounds. And thereafter, ninety to ninety-nine, and then some words and the connected speech. So that is the speech sample one we decide about is for a specific uh, purpose for the endoscopy, and we use uniformly for all patients. throughout our uh, endoscopy procedure in all of them next please so you can see it's a, such a simple procedure and uh, i think there is lot of inertia in utilizing the equipment which is very very important for assessing the vpd and before performing the surgery as well as as a biofeedback in follow up of your surgery one should always have this facility of endoscopy and one can keep doing it i take hardly 5 minutes for the procedure but it requires little preparation by the slp or assistant and counseling during the uh, endoscopy but it is not very difficult uh, uh, procedure to perform now this uh, picture shows the difference between the flexible endoscope and the rigid one the top one is the flexible endoscope if you see the flexible endo endoscope it goes through the middle uh, meters of the nasal cavity and once it crosses the uh, it reaches the nasopharynx you will see the posterior pharyngeal wall and then one has to flex it down the flexible endoscope can be flexed up and down 180 degree and uh, 0 degree and 180 degree you can so one has to flex the uh, endoscope so that you can visualize the nasal uh, this uh, velopharyngeal sphincter correctly you can see it has been flexed at the point and thereafter the light emission goes up to the uh, velopharyngeal sphincter and then we visualize so it requires a little bit of manipulation of the uh, flexible endoscope this while manipulating one has to be very sure that you are pushing it down rather than up sometimes we commit that mistake of flexing it up rather than down and then we get lost so that is one uh, technique one has to learn uh, while performing the flexible endoscope while in 70 degree rigid endoscope you see it straight way it goes into the middle cavity and reaches to the nasopharynx and one can have the correct vision direct without any manipulation of the endoscope you can visualize it next please but there is a pros and cons of each one of them rigid endoscope is much easier to insert as i said in the previous uh, slide it gives better picture quality you have seen in the video also it is easy to manipulate insert and visualize however there is a risk of trauma if the child moves the head then the rigid endoscope might cause a bleeding and it will obscure your vision it may cause a little uh, pain also to the child and it is difficult to insert when there is a 
septal deviation, especially in UCLPs, when there is a septal deviation significant, then it is difficult to insert. But in adolescents and adults, whatever kind of patients you have, we should be able to insert the rigid endoscope. If I am not able to insert through the side of the cavity, uh, the cleft side, I will use the opposite side, the non-cleft side of the nose, and then I will insert the endoscope. However, if I am not able to insert in either way, I will use the flexible endoscope and then perform the endoscopy. Next, please. So this tells us about the difference between the rigid and, nasal, uh, rigid and the flexible endoscope. As collective, there is no difference between two of them. What we should see, Dr. Mukund has already explained about the speech and its connectivity with the pictures of the or video of the uh, uh, nasal, nasal endoscopy. But theoretically, what we should know is we should notice in two parts. One static view and second is the dynamic when we insert the endoscope static position we should see the uh, we should see the anatomy we should see any abnormalities there if there is any uh, lesion is there fistula is there previous surgery is there or there is uh, any problem with the nasal septum or terminal these all things can be visualized one can see the bifid uvula you can see the tilted septum or uvula uh, going on one side the static position itself, you can see the gap on the right and left of the velopharyngeal sphincter. Next, please. After examining in static position, we should ask the child to speak what we have decided about the speech sample. And then we normally we see the five things when we examine the uh, inside the cavity, when the child is speaking whatever uh, material you have given or sample, speech sample you have given. One is the closing pattern. Second is the degree of closure of the sphincter. Third is the formation of mucus bubble. Fourth is the mobility of each element of the velopharyngeal sphincter. And fifth is the formation of palatal groove in the midline or zona pellucida or blue line, which we can see in the midline. Next, please. Now, these are the different patterns of the closure of the sphincter. Probably in next uh, webinar, we, when we will talk about the uh, decision making will discuss about the role of this uh, closure pattern of the sphincter. We can get concentric, we can get vertical slit, which uh, a lot of people call it as sagittal. It can be horizontal, which is called as coronal. One can have oval or bow tie and horseshoe. So there are multiple variety of uh, uh, closure of the sphincter, but the commonest is the horizontal slit, which is coronal closure as we know that palate will move behind and touch the posterior pharyngeal wall. So almost 70% of population has got the horizontal closure, while the vertical slit, the coronal, this uh, sagittal is only 5%, and then concentric is there 20 to 25%, and rest of the 2-3% is by the irregular and the horseshoe or bow tie or oval closure, depending upon the different uh, situation of the palatal movement. Next, please. Then we see the mobility of the different elements of the velopharyngeal sphincter. And we have to, what we have to notice is what is the most dominant element amongst the palate, posterior pharyngeal wall and lateral walls. Usually either the lateral walls will be dominant or the palate will be dominant. We, tend, we, we expect that palate will be dominant. If palate is dominant, then there will be uh, coronal closure and it happens in majority of them. And then other elements also, we should see the degree of movement if it is there or if it is not there because that decides the procedure which we have to plan in the pharyngoplasties. Next, please. So we have seen the closure. Then we have seen the uh, mobility of the elements. Then we have to see the gap of the velopharyngeal sphincter between the enteroposterior and side to side when patient is, child is speaking. So how much is left? Is it too deep? or it's too wide, or it is mild or moderate. There is no specific measurement possible in nasal endoscope, which is possible in video fluoroscope. You can see in the next presentation, it is possible to measure the gap. But in nasal endoscope, it is not possible, but you can have the mild, moderate, and severe type of assessment of the gap, which we visualize in the endoscopy. Next, please. Then, degree of closure. Is it good closure? It is soft closure? 
it is small gap is there moderate gap is there large so these are all subjective one has to assess the degree of closure and this comes with experience and the, if you see the literature and uh, you keep doing you will be able to understand how to decide what is soft closure what is the moderate gap and the large gap next please next avita yeah so these are the elements which we see in endoscopy either it is flexible or rigid and then we join all the information of history intraoral examination perceptual assessment by the surgeon perceptual assessment by the uh, slp and the nasal endoscopy findings and video fluoroscopy findings and then make the conclusion about the next step of management of uh, these uh, vpd children over to savita please thank you thank you dr karun uh, before we go forward we would like to take uh, some questions uh, there are already some that have come in the chat box um Dr. Mukund Reddy, this uh, can you please answer this question? Can endoscopy be done adequately on a patient in supine or lying down position as well? Never tried it, uh, but then uh, why do you want to do it in a supine? And then endoscopy can be passed, obviously, but then uh, a patient to speak and for you to record, he has to sit. If he is lying down, the palate falls backward, and then uh, it will alter the findings. So it is not done done with the patient in uh, lying position. It's always done with this uh, patient sitting up. Uh, then there's this other question. Uh, in our center in Indonesia, we solely detect VPD clinically. How far is it reliable to indicate or to de to determine the indication of velopharyngeal flap surgery? Thank you. Uh, if you are asking how do you decide when to do a flap without doing an endoscope or a video fluoroscope, it would be difficult because nowadays conventional flap surgery is outmoded. No, I don't think anybody does the conventional flap surgery, the inferiorly or superiorly placed one, which you are attaching to the edge of the palate. That that surgery is not being done. Basically, this is required to differentiate whether the palate movement is good enough to come close enough to the posterior pharyngeal wall, so that you can do a physiological surgery, either furloughs or a lengthening procedure or a muzzle tightening procedure, or a different type of procedure, a pharyngoplasty, which is a different, nowadays it is being done in a different way, which will be covered in the next webinar. But then without doing an endoscope, I'm afraid it's very difficult to assess in which patients you should do physiological surgery and which patients you will do a flap surgery. Uh, uh, yes, idea of, the idea of this webinar is answer to the question which has been raised by the delegate. That can we perform BPD surgery without objective assessment? That is what Dr. Mukun said, absolutely right, that without the objective assessment, one can do it. Performing surgery is not a big deal. But are we doing the right thing? Are we justifying the problem which, we, which the child is having? Are we able to sort it out? That is not right. So as far as possible, we should combine all the elements of the assessment. Thereafter, we can decide the right procedure. And that will give a better better, uh, larger number of children will be benefited with these surgeries. If we do not perform objectively, then probably the choice of surgery is not, may not be right in some of them. And then it will not be doing justice to them. That's why we must have instrumentation and objectivity in our assessment. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, in my opinion, clinically you can suspect VPD but you can confirm VPD only after you look at the structures. And uh, that's when you get a profile of the velopharyngeal pore. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, then the next question is, uh, what is the software that is used for simultaneous audio and video recording? Most vendors do not have the same. Yes, this I was, uh, this, I'll be able to tell you much more detail in uh, next time because I'm not really ready with the uh, detail of the software. However, this is given by the vendor himself. OSCE is the uh, software, O-S-C-E-E, 
double E, Husky is the software, which is supplied separately. It is not the part of the endoscopy system, but it, it has been preloaded in the laptop and then they have given two doggles and this doggle connects, one doggle connects with the patient uh, mic and the other doggle connects with the uh, surgeon's mic. So you require two doggles for two different mics and the video will be of course recorded with the uh, system which is existing with the endoscopy system. So you need to have interface between the audio as well as video for simultaneous recording. Yeah. Uh, the other software that helps you to do this is called the Diva software. Uh, this is what we were using uh, I mean, and I think it's still being used at the Ramchandra Clefton Craniofacial Unit, uh, is uh, the, the digital imaging and video recording interface. That's what it's called. Diva. That's, uh, yeah, but, but uh, none of, of the, them. many are there available. Are many yeah, there are many of them. Yeah. None, none of the uh, endoscopy equipments come attached with it. You have to look yes. at it as a separate computer interface and then install, but there are plenty available, definitely. Yes, it is, I, it is plenty. Can I say uh, one yes, point sir. I would like to make is, because when we bought, the, this was in 2000 or 2000, 2011 or 2010, we bought the endoscope. It came with preloaded software for recording the voice and the uh, picture. But the clarity was not really up to the mark. So what we did was we adapted and used a routine video camera kept on the side. And then we used a video camera to photograph both the uh, procedure and the voice. So I can show you when I, when I showed you the, this one. Uh, I, if you give me a minute, I can share this just to show. Okay, just I'll share the screen. Yeah, you see, this is the monitor and uh, they are the console. There is a, it, it does contain the software, but we have stopped using it because it's uh, of poor quality. But you can always see, you know it. In India, we said, you got, you do something. So we put a camera here. And then with this camera, you need another person to record because with the software, you can directly, the speech pathologist can require, record both the audio and video directly onto the computer. But if you want to record here, you have to, somebody else has to do it and you have to again copy it onto the computer, but it can be done. You have seen the quality when I projected, but it gives a decent quality recording of both the uh, audio as well as video. Thank so thank you all for this uh, section. We will go forward with the next section where we will be looking at multi-view um, video fluoroscopy. So uh, I know centers um, which use endoscopy exclusively uh, for assessment of velopharyngeal dysfunction. There are also centers which use uh, lateral view video fluoroscopy exclusively when it comes to endoscopy assessments. Um, what is important is visualization through any one particular modality. Visualization is important either through endoscopy or video fluoroscopy. Uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, would you just like to start off? I will share yeah, your sure. uh, presentation right. in a bit. Okay, so while uh, Savita is loading, I had some issues. I can't run the videos from my screen. I passed it on to Savita. While she's loading it, uh, I would like to once again welcome everybody. Uh, it's nice to have people from so many countries. Uh, and today, today, uh, uh, if you if you do not know, uh, is is quite a special day. It's called the Juneteenth Day, right? June 19th uh, in 1865 was the day when officially slavery was abolished in in the United States. And it is celebrated as Juneteenth Day by many people, particularly in the U.S. And looking at what's happened in the, in the recent few weeks, uh, I think it's a significantly important day. So uh, there is a slight uh, change in what, uh, uh, from what Savita told you all. I'm not going to speak on multi-view view video fluoroscopy because we do only the lateral uh, one. However, there are a couple of sites that will explain what multi-view video fluoroscopy is and how it can be done as well. 
Uh, I come from Bangalore and I'm a maxillofacial surgeon. Bangalore is one of the, uh, the cooler cities of India uh, and has also escaped a major wrath of uh, the virus as of now. Can I have the next one, please? So, uh, like it was mentioned by uh, Dr. Reddy earlier, you use either a, a digi digital subtraction angiography or a, a digital uh, imaging machine. Uh, most of us go to a cat lab to do, do this. And uh, most commonly what we do is a lateral video fluoroscopy. That's what you see on the screen below. Uh, this will give uh, it, uh, it movement mainly of the palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall. You will not be able to look at the lateral wall as you saw in the nasoendoscopy. This is, will be one big difference if you did only lateral video fluoroscopy is that you would see only the movement of the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall. And what we do here is you, uh, you do a similar uh, process as recording uh, speech uh, while you click the images, but the screenshot that we take will be one that we acquire the velum at rest. And when it, the velum at, is at its maximum movement, particularly when it is trying to uh, uh, express a oral pressure consonant. And here, like uh, earlier Karun Agarwal mentioned to us that one of the advantages of doing a lateral video fluoroscopy is that we can measure the deficiency. So that is expressed as a closure ratio, right? So if the closure, if the soft palate can go and touch against the posterior pharyngeal wall, the closure ratio is one. If it doesn't move at all, it is zero. And then you can have in between zero to one being the closure ratio when you have a velopharyngeal dysfunction. Uh, if you use barium swallow, either in the form of uh, a liquid, uh, then through the nose, that is, then it will be helpful in uh, getting a multi-view. When we do a lateral video fluoroscopy, that is not usually done. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the part of the setup. Uh, what you saw in the previous slide was a DSA, and that is the screen on the upper hand corner where uh, you, you see you can uh, record the video as well as get screenshots. Remember, you can have a recorded uh, version of the whole uh, episode as well as you have two screenshots, one the velum at rest and the other one velum at maximum movement. Uh, one of the common questions that is being asked is whether you need to go to the cat lab or to a DSA machine. Can you use the regular C arm that you see in the lower picture to, uh, to do this? Uh, you can use the C arm, uh, I believe, as, as, as uh, uh, easily as you do uh, DSA. One of the reasons that we haven't done that is that our C arms are not uh, equipped with uh, recording devices and therefore we are not able to use them, but I'm told that it is uh, quite easily possible. The next slide, please. Right, so advantages is it's uh, non-invasive, which means this is one of the problems that we might have, we, has been alluded to already, that if you're uh, wanting to assess it in a very young child, uh, who may not be cooperative enough for you to pass a scope, if you have a problem where there is a significant deviation or a block on both nostrils, uh, uh, you may not, uh, be able to do it without uh, uh, much of a problem to the child. So this is one of the reasons why it can be used. Most of the times I would believe that uh, whether a, a per, when a particular device is used, it's probably because of availability and also uh, familiarity with that. And uh, I think uh, the speech and language pathologists here will agree with us that in most instances, either one should be sufficient. Uh, the other thing is here, we can see the size the, of the opening and the length of the velum can be estimated. Also, we, uh, on this, structures like uh, adenoid pad, Passamas ridge, uh, and the contact of velum can be well, well studied. It's, it's, it's quite a clear-cut image. Uh, can we just play the video now? You can just quickly see uh, uh, this is something that... Uh, 64, 65... Sarita, can you point out at the soft palette, please? Yeah. You can you can very clearly see Savita One, earlier showed showed the picture. That's fine. We don't have to five, go back to that. Seven, 68, 69, 70. 
Now, the disadvantage is being, can we go back? Sorry. Uh, the Sorry. disadvantage of this being that, uh, that you have a radiation exposure, that uh, the, there's a shorter length of examination and uh, unavailability of uh, uh, equipment might be an issue. Uh, uh, even when you have it in a hospital, you may not have access for your cleft patients. That might be an issue. And occasionally, this lateral video fluoroscopy may not give you the full picture like a nasoendoscopy would. So for that, you have the next slide, please, the multi-view video fluoroscopy. So here you take three different views. So you're exposing uh, the patient to three different views. The lateral, which I already showed you, you also can do a frontal view as well as a basal view. And combining the information from all three views, you will be able to get uh, a multi-view uh, imaging. And this would be as good as uh, 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 the nasoendoscopy. Uh, in, in this situation, you will have to use barium because otherwise uh, the, the structures may not be visible because of a lot of overlap, particularly in the frontal and basal views. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I do not see this being commonly used anywhere in the world. Very rarely you see people presenting uh, their findings on this, but if required, it can be done. And here is a, a frontal view. Can we play the video, please? Baba, Papa, Fifi, Fifi, Baba, Baba, Sixty, Sixty, Seventy. Okay, so what you see there is a pharyngeal, uh, lateral pharyngeal wall movement. Uh, if you didn't see it very well, ignore it. Next slide, please. Baba, Papa. So we will stick to in, in this discussion to lateral view video fluoroscopy because that is the one which we always use. And that is the one you will find that authorities in the world around using. Uh, you can view it without a contrast material. We have tried using contrast, but I am told that we don't have a, a, li a liquid preparation uh, available or the other way around and it, it runs off. And so we have not used it. Um, you can uh, use it in a sm smaller children as well because barium installation, installation might again uh, lead to non-cooperation of the patient. You will also get information here, like I said, on the velum, the, the posterior pharyngeal wall. You can see if uh, uh, the movement of the soft palate you see is, is in fact, a uh, tongue pushing the soft palate up, compensatory tongue movements. That is something that uh, uh, is a very important information. I will show you one of the pictures where the apparent movement of the soft palate is not actually the movement of the soft palate, but it is your tongue that is pushing the soft palate up. Okay, but you will not get, as I said, information on the lateral pharyngeal walls. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so this is what uh, a, 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 a few pictures of how it is done here. Uh, uh, on a DSA, it is done a patient lying. We do not have a software that is uh, compatible with our DSA machine to record the speech. So we do that separately. So there is an extra labor involved. I must say that uh, all this work is carried out by my speech and language pathologist. Uh, there are a couple of questions I would like to, I think might come to your mind, I would like to answer. One of the things is how do we gain access to the uh, cat lab and what do we pay for it? So uh, Aparna, my speech and language pathologist does all this. In fact, she should have been doing this presentation. She's available here to take your question for any specific issues. Uh, one of the things is uh, uh, she's a very nice lady and she has uh, developed such a fabulous rapport with the technicians at the cat lab that she can go and come in whenever she wants, only at a time when they're extremely busy or doing some uh, serious procedure like they, they are wont to do, uh, they will ask her to wait. So we don't need to take appointments. 90% of the time, I would say, Aparna can correct me if I'm wrong, she's able to get it done on the same day. All it requires is a little bit of gentle persuasion and sweet talking uh, with, the, with the people involved. And uh, they do not charge anything for us because I don't think it costs anything. So, so we are able to do it uh, as and when required, except in situations when the cath lab is not free. So, so that is something, a mechanism that you can develop. Uh, if you want, you can ask Aparna for uh, more details. So the problem here is the speech is recorded separately and then she sits and merges the speech with the, with the video. 
sometimes if it doesn't happen uh, well then you can get a disconnect between the two so there are problems uh, but uh, uh, this is managed extremely well by Aparna and her team of speech and language pathologists at my department next slide please so uh, once again we've already seen the speech protocol things i will not waste uh, any uh, uh, any of your time going through that again except to say that Aparna tells me that if, if, if VPI is evident in the initial part of assessment, she uses fewer speech stimuli, tries to get this done quickly. That's the only difference. Uh, the next slide, please. And these are, the, uh, so these are the stimuli that she uses. We've already seen that. And she says that based on the speech evaluation and as, as, as it go on, you, you may not do the whole thing that it may be a shorter procedure as well. So that is efficiency. Uh, makes everybody happy. You have your diagnosis. Next slide, please. So you can see a lot of things. You can see the thickness and the length of the velum. You can look at the velar knee or the point of contact. Remember, uh, uh, in a normal uh, situation, as the soft palate goes up, it doesn't go backwards completely. It goes superiorly and then backwards to almost the junction of the nasopharynx to the base of the skull and the bend in the soft palate that you see in a normal palate is the genu or the knee. Uh, sometimes in repaired palates they're absent, sometimes they're weak. So even though there is movement, you find that the gap is more because the palate is going more posterior rather than posterior superiorly. You can also find out where the contact is happening. You saw from the nasoendoscopes already that the contact is happening uh, right at the height of the nasopharynx. Uh, sometimes you will find a patient of repaired cleft palate who doesn't have a strong genu or knee or a vela movement. Closure is occurring much lower down uh, in the, in the uh, uh, posterior pharyngeal wall and that's, that's, that's not a good uh, place where it can contact and you could have problem. And also, as I said, we, we, have, we take two screenshots. One is the gap at rest, which can be measured. That is the distance from the uh, soft palate to the posterior pharyngeal wall. And we can also measure the distance from the posterior pharyngeal wall to the soft palate at maximum movement and take this as a ratio and, uh, and describe closure in a ratio. We will go into that in a little more detail. We can look at adenoidal pads. Remember, this can be a very important thing. We will talk about that in a minute. We can look at the movement of the posterior pharyngeal wall, whether it is uh, pro providing a big pasamas ridge, as uh, uh, Dr. Mukund Reddy said, that the presence of a big pasamas ridge itself tells us that uh, uh, the posterior pharyngeal wall is trying to compensate for the lack of enough movement from the soft palate. And tongue movement during articulation, that's another information important that might help you to, to, to find out how much the soft palate is really moving. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, when I say this is a normal uh, uh, LVV, uh, LVFS is a lateral video fluoroscopy and you can listen to a normal sample. 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. One of the important things that you will see, I understood this much later, that it, it is not just the movement, you know, the soft palate does not come back to its original position between uh, utterances. It stays very, very close, almost in, in contact if it is required. And that is why I think it, it happens so much effortlessly in a normal palate, but oftentimes you will find that in uh, cleft palates, repaired cleft palates, you find that there is closure, but still there is, uh, there could be a hypernasality, etc. Because uh, that consistency, so you find that when you ask somebody to uh, say just a word or a syllable, the, it seems to be all right. But when they go on to a connected speech, when they start speaking at the speed that I am now speaking, that th they go all over the place. The reason for that is that uh, it, not, it is not consistently touching. It gets fatigued or whatever else that happens that it moves away. Whereas in a normal soft palate, um, which is not scarred, which is not having any developmental anomaly, it appears that it is very close and then it has to do less work to continuously speak as we do. 
Uh, that is one thing. So therefore, never uh, believe uh, that somebody who can speak a sentence, I mean a word or a syllable properly, does not have velopharyngeal dysfunction. A lot of these people have problem when it comes to connected speech. You ask them to say 61, 62, they say that. But when you ask them to talk like this, nobody understands anything. That is something which is important. Next slide, please. So here are certain um, uh, uh, samples of uh, uh, video fluoroscopies along with some speech samples as well. This is a, uh, so uh, I, I did not know what RCLP was for a long time. Uh, this is in the speech pathologist lingo. It is repaired cleft lip and palate. So a speech and a video fluoroscopy, which is normal. Yeah. 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. Okay. Now. P, 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 You see that consistently there is closure there. Next slide, please. This is what you would uh, want to have in all your patients. Unfortunately, it does not happen. So here is something which Aparna says is hypernasality and nasal air emission only, uh, mainly or only. 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. 91, 91, 92, 92. The video? You, you see? Pee, pee. Pee, pee. Pee, Can you show the gap? Yeah, the knee and the gap. Yeah, there you are. You see? Papa. Tata. Tata. Kaka. Kaka. Sasa. Sasa. So a word of caution for uh, doing all these diagnoses based on instrumental assessment alone. There was a question asked earlier whether you can do surgeries without instrumental assessment and our panel very strongly felt that we should not do it and I agree with that. However, it's also the yeah, converse is also not true that you just look at uh, video fluoroscopies like this and do a, a surgery. You could do a surgery, but the problem here is uh, more cosmetic, as if I can call it that, because here uh, you can understand what he's speaking very clearly, but you, you have additional sounds in the form of emission, etc. So intelligibility of speech or understandability of speech is also important. We have to keep that in mind. It is possible that in all cases where you do not have a complete closure, we may not have to do surgeries. This is just a word of caution, right? In a case like this. Next slide, please. 60. So here is a Pasama's ridge, a big one. Uh, watch below the soft palate as it comes and tries to. Yeah. 70, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67. So this is going to be a diagnostic, a bit of a diagnostic dilemma because you see there is good movement of the soft palate. The soft palate genu is there. It's going and touching where it should touch. But uh, below that level, there is a big protrusion of the posterior pharyngeal wall as the Passama's ridge. And like you, like you heard from Dr. Reddy, this indicates that there, there is not adequate effort happening from the soft palate. And uh, you may have to take a closer look here to decide whether you want to operate on these patients or not. Most of the times, um, uh, if closure is not happening, there is no problem. But here, there may be a little bit of a debate on whether this patient needs any treatment at all uh, in the form of a secondary speech surgery. Next slide, please. Now, adenoids, uh, before we play this slide, Savita, don't play it. Uh, it's extremely yeah. important uh, for us to tell our ENT colleagues not to do adenotonsillectomies for these children because obviously today it does not happen to that extent like it happened when I was a child because in, in, in at least 20% uh, I read in, in, in a paper uh, that of, of children, there could be a thick adenoidal pad and if you go and shave it off, you're going to make them uh, straight away uh, dysfunctional. So, uh, so it's not something that you would regularly carry out. You see a stick adenoidal pad here. Uh, can we have the recording now? E, 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 e. 
Okay, so that's a thick adenoidal pad. We, we should appreciate that it is there and make sure it stays as long as it is physiologically re required. Next slide, please. And then this is compensatory tongue movement. Just watch how the soft palate moves here. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight. A lot of times the, 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 the soft palate is being lifted up by the tongue, right? So that is something uh, which is useful for us to know. Next slide, please. So these are the various examples that we saw. Next slide. Okay. So uh, what is important now here is to when you get uh, uh, images like this for us to know, uh, uh, quantify the defect. Once you know that the closure is not happening, it's important to quantify the defect. Somalad and his group have done a lot of work and uh, how to analyze LVF. These are the three articles from which uh, uh, we have culled out the data to analyze it. Next slide, please. Basically, what we do here is, uh, uh, like I said, you, you, you superimpose both the, the <clears throat> two screenshots that you've got. One is at rest and one, it, one is at maximum movement. And look at the diagram there. That's the posterior pharyngeal wall. D is the posterior pharyngeal wall. Uh, a, B is the soft palate at rest. A, C is the velum at the maximum closure. So you draw the tangents uh, like from A to C like so, and then you draw uh, 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 where the tangent meets the hard palate. You draw A to B, and then you draw the uh, line passing through the uh, knee into the posterior pharyngeal wall. So with this is what you do for every case using the two screenshot that you have. So B, D is the resting gap. That is where the distance between the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall at rest. And BC is the velum excursion, how much it has moved. And CD is the velar gap. So if you're not getting a complete closure, CD is the gap that is there still after maximum movement. That is when you have velopharyngeal dysfunction. Closure ratio is as simple as BC by uh, CD. Uh, so you, you will get numbers, as I said, from zero to one, one being normal, zero being nothing at all. So this is how you analyze. This is from those uh, Somalad articles. Next slide, please. We have also, um, okay, right, next slide, please. Uh, based on uh, this particular article, we have now combined the closure ratio values that we get into different categories. So of severity. So this is what uh, makes this a, a, a useful tool, not only for your diagnosis, but also for your management and later on for post-op analysis to see uh, what has happened. I hope we will get a chance to discuss this in greater detail in the next one. So if you have one, uh, obviously your happy home. If you have zero, you have to really worry what to do. But when you have 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, uh, uh, it's a small gap. They call it an efficient closure and you may not want to do a surgery in this case. He's a good candidate for therapy. It's stimulable, it says. And if it's 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 or 0 0.1 to 3 average and large gaps and you need to do whatever uh, you need to do. So this gives us the idea based on the closure ratio for a given patient, whether we are talking about a very large gap, a intermediate gap or a, or a small gap efficient closure and what may need it to be done. So that comes out of this paper from PRS 2007. Next slide please. However, you don't have to you don't have to go and uh, look at the, all those papers. Uh, Aparna has written up a paper and which has been published this year, uh, last year in the Indian Journal of Plastic Surgery. Uh, the link is given below. You can uh, get access. It's an open access uh, article and you can read it completely. So the method of uh, how we, uh, how we uh, capture the lateral video fluoroscopy, how we do the measurements and how we apply uh, 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 the uh, severity grading, all of that is uh, clearly uh, depicted in this paper and I hope it helps you uh, in, uh, in making use of uh, this important tool for your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti. Dr. Krishnamurti, um, there's a question for you. If you're, using yeah. the cat, if you're using the cat lab, are all of your LVFS being done supine then? Could yes. this lead to overestimation of palatal motion due to impact of gravity? Uh, 
I, I don't know that whether there's an impact of gravity, but uh, one thing is sure, uh, uh, this is not, like I said, the only measure that we use uh, to do the diagnosis. Uh, perceptual speech assessment is extremely important. Uh, and uh, so also when we find that there is a conflict, when there is a conflict between our perceptual speech uh, uh, measurement and our LVF, then we go and do a nasoendoscopy. I have access to nasoendoscopy. Uh, I don't do it for every case, but wherever there has been a conflict, you know, you find that, uh, that on a lateral video fluoroscopy, you find closure and you find that there is a significant hypernasality. One of the examples, you go and do video fluoroscopy and you can see what is happening. It's sometimes the lateral pharyngeal walls not moving. So I, I don't know the answer to the question whether the gravity does any changes, but our assessment is based on multiple inputs. Uh, and uh, it's consistent. Uh, Dr. Dr. Reddy, consistent. Dr. Reddy, do you have anything to add to this, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the question cropped up long time back when we started this. We did a study with the patient uh, in supine and sitting position and found that there is no difference in the video fluoroscopic findings. Sir, can I add? Yes, yeah, Aparna. Aparna. Come on, Aparna. Uh, sir, uh, uh, the, speak, the sleep study specialist, uh, according to their studies, they say when you are awake, uh, the gravity may not affect your tonicity. So when you are awake and you are do, performing a task, when you when you are in supine position, and the uh, the gravity will not affect because your muscles are tonic and then you are uh, it's moving uh, according right. to your right. Uh, uh, Savita, can I add something? Yes, sir. Uh, those of you who are now uh, thinking of uh, building up a good team of uh, uh, secondary speech surgery and offering wheel of services of velopharyngeal dysfunction, the biggest asset you need is a very good speech and language pathologist. Keep them happy uh, and uh, uh, your job is easy. You just have to go in and operate. The rest of the things are, uh, are just academy. Right, Savita? I love, I love that answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah. there, uh, sorry, this is Manta. I have to come in here. There's a question from uh, Dr. Mamdu from Egypt. And uh, I guess this question is for everyone, particularly uh, Dr. Karun Agarwal. Uh, the youngest age for rigid and flexible nasoendoscopy. At what uh, the youngest age where both these can be done? Um, this uh, age is a big question mark. Nobody can really vouch for a specific age which is possible. However, the, uh, I tend to do uh, rigid endoscope after 10 years of age in majority of them. After 10 years, almost everybody I do the uh, rigid endoscope. But between 5 and 10, I tend to use flexible endoscope in majority of them. But there are few children of uh, unilateral cleft lip and palate, even at the age of 13, 14. Uh, they do not... Uh, they are not very comfortable having the uh, rigid endoscope because of the severe uh, DNS and it, the endoscope keeps stretching. So if in that situation, if patient is not comfortable, in one go, if doesn't go, the rigid one, I will switch over to flexible endoscope. I prefer rigid only because the quality of uh, picture is better and it is easy to see the correct vision of the velopharyngeal sphincter. That's why I use the uh, rigid one. And if I, it is not possible to use rigid, I will use the flexible without any hesitation. Is it, uh, is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, I think we're good there. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Narayanan wants to ask a question. Uh, his hand is up. Yes. Yes, Hello. Dr. Narayanan. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes, Dr. Narayanan. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, the role of adenoids when we see it in, on endoscopy, we see different uh, formations of these sometimes. And I don't, many patients that I've seen 20 years or 30 years old, still the adenoids have not involuted. Is it a compensation for this uh, uh, speech? I don't know. But there are uh, adenoids where the surface is not even. So there are areas where it, because of its projection, it closed the, uh, palate, the uh, willow pharynx closes partly 
but on the sides where there is a, a groove in the adenoid, it's not uh, closed. What do we do in those cases? Um, uh, Narayanan, as much I uh, I have experienced this adenoid used to be a problem when they, we used to do the late uh, palatoplasty. It used to be very commonly seen in the late palatoplasty, but now I don't see many of the adenoids prominently seen. As you said, the situation where a adenoid has got groove on the side, still the even if the small groove is there which is causing uh, air leak, probably we should wait for the uh, involution of the adenoid. As Dr. Krishnamurti said, we must avoid adenoidectomy in these patients unless it is symptomatic. If it is causing the uh, symptoms and it is causing the uh, uh, problem for the patient, systemically causing fever and uh, uh, infective uh, foci are there, then only we should go for surgery. Otherwise, we should not go for the risk of the VPI. And uh, in due course of time, once it involutes, maybe we can take care. Thank you. Sir, but the question not, sir. is not about the yeah. adenoidectomy itself. Yeah. It's when there is a gap there at one, one aspect of it, not maybe one, the centrally there is a closure, on the side there is a gap. Do you call that velopharyngeal incompetence? Do you need to treat that in, I mean, I don't think we need... I don't hesitate. I will not hesitate going ahead and do the sphincter pharyngoplasty in that situation or the palatal surgery. I will avoid doing the posterior pharyngeal wall surgery in such patients where adenoids are there. So I have to limit to lateral pharyngeal wall surgery as well as the palatal surgery. Yeah, we can... Dr. Reddy, yeah. It's discussion, but uh, adenoids, uh, there is alternative view in the sense some people do uh, shave off the adenoids when they are contemplating on pharyngeal flaps. So that uh, view has been uh, expressed uh, by one speech pathologist. Isunza was my colleague in one of the workshops. Uh, no, that is not. Said that in Jackson Institute, there, um, they do a adenoidectomy, wait for two, three weeks for it to heal, then do a, a pharyngeal flap surgery where it's indicated, where the gap is large. But I can understand what Narayanan is asking. That what happens if there is an adenoid and there is a small gap through which air bubbles? You have to do something. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult uh, problem to answer. Because if the adenoids atrophy, whether it is going to close because soft palate is got enough strength to close it or not, right. nobody is sure. We have to see, wait and see. Sir, sir, also he's talking of patients who are 20 years plus. So, so do you think there's going to be a change uh, in the status at that point? Uh, isn't isn't it better off at that age to take a consult with the ENT to see if there are any contraindications about shaving the adenoid? Uh, because there's anyway a gap. There is anyway a gap. So 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 there's anyway a small gap. A small gap versus a large gap. Is that going to make a difference? No, it's yeah, not about should... adenoids. Uh, their point of view about whether adenoids can be shaved or not. They could be shaved in a younger age group as well. It's a it's a the, the your apprehensive apprehension is about whether uh, I, it's going to increase the BPD. That's why you are afraid. Uh, but when it's closing and there is a small gap, if you shave it, it becomes a bigger gap. Then you end up with a bit of a bigger problem. So, but then uh, that's an that's a individual uh, decision. The ENT surgeons usually will say we can shave off at 20. Even younger children, they are. They take the call if there is a repeated respiratory infection. They are for uh, shaving off the adenoids. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going ahead with some of the other questions uh, that are there. Uh, again, there's another question on position for endoscopy. What do you think is the most comfortable position for a patient for rigid endoscope? Uh, I think we already answered this question. Uh, is there anything more you would like to add to it, Dr. Karun? Uh, actually, uh, one one thing is there is the uh, when we do the rigid endoscope, patient should be upright, straight, and the head should be straight gaze. If the head is up, then it does not go to the middle meters and it uh, goes to the superior meters and then it goes on the wrong direction. So one has to have the patient sitting straight in front of you, as I showed you in the video, 
and the nasal endoscope should go to the middle meters and go straight. The advantage of rigid is your one hand is free, only one hand is occupied, so you can hold the head of the patient and you do, do not require any assistance. While in flexible endoscope, you require to manipulate the flexible endoscope with both the hands. So you require one assistant to help you in keeping the head stable. So that's the only difference which I can think of, but the position remains same for both the endoscope. Thank you, sir. Um, can this instrumental assessment be done before speech bulb or palatal lift? Definitely, yes, yes. And I would say you have to do it, in fact. Uh, so it can be done. Um, and uh, another question is, uh, is it necessary to use an interface or software to combine the audio and video for fluoroscopy? Can we directly record using Image Pro? Um, Aparna, yes. is there anything that you want to answer for this? Uh, I, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the, what uh, uh, they have mentioned in Somalad's article is they have used an Image Pro software directly to com uh, merge the audio to the video signal. So it can be done with an Image Pro. Okay. So it's all also used for uh, superimposing the images. So, so yes, you can use with the Image Pro as well. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience before we go forward with the case presentation? But Let's as much as I know about the DSA, uh, DSA lab, they yes, do not sir. have the audio output. The problem of uh, DSA they have never thought of audio output in DSA. But it is there in the, uh, you can say in C-arm. Now the digital C-arm which are coming now, they have got the audio uh, output also because it has got an interface. But it does not have the recording system. So you can have the laptop and you can take the interface and record with the uh, uh, Pro Image or OSCE or any other software. Any other. Yeah, any other. So that is possible. Yeah. So, now the so technology has developed so much, we may not know all those technology and it is possible if we tell the technical person, they should be able to sort out the issue. Yeah, yes. uh, uh, we have repeatedly tried to find some solution for that. We haven't been successful. So we are using a separate record of, uh, as of now for the speech. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for all the discussions. We will go forward now with the case presentation. Uh, it's going to be a quick, short presentation. Uh, so, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Krishnamurti and Aparna to please uh, go Aparna, ahead. With, uh... Aparna will do it. Yeah, Aparna. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so, I just uh, this is a case um, uh, who has reported to our clinic and uh, a suspected case of willowfringe incompetency. Uh, so, 26-year-old female who was a software engineer and who had unclear speech since childhood and uh, uh, she was not successful on getting any treatment done for that. Uh, there was no report of any other uh, uh, issues related to cleft like uh, nasal regurgitation or so. And uh, on examination, uh, it was found that she had uh, no velar movement intraorally and there were no signs of uh, occult or overt cleft, submucous cleft palate. So a speech assessment was recommended. Next slide. Uh, so perceptual speech assessment was done and uh, this is how her uh, speech sounded. Sentence repetition. Yeah. Say so Mary came home. Mary came home. Read it. Oh, yeah. Mary came home. The mommy is playing with the rope. Mom is a baby boy. The phone fell off the shelf. Dave is driving, driving a van. This hand is clear. Than the other. So, saw a so uh, uh, her complete uh, uh, speech recording was done and this is one of the sample and based on all uh, uh, the speech stimuli assessed and we have uh, uh, rated her speech on our uh, uh, rating scale uh, which is commonly used in all the centers. So uh, this will give you uh, uh, information about uh, hypernasality. So she had a moderate hypernasality. Uh, she had audible nasal air emission. Then there were compensatory and obligatory speech errors 
so her speech understandability was rated as moderate and uh, speech acceptability as severe so uh, she was diagnosed as having misarticulation with hypernasality and nasal air emission secondary to query velopharyngeal incompetency and based on this a lateral view video fluoroscopy was um, recommended and uh, this is her lateral view video fluoroscopy Say ah, ah, ah. So you can see um, he had a dosh intra orally. There was no. Ah, ah, ah. P P P. P P P. Ba ba ba. Ba ba ba. P P P. B B B. Ta ta ta. Ta ta ta. P P P. P P P. So intraorally, though there was no velar movement observed, so there was uh, on LVF we found that the velum is moving for certain vowels. So it was only for vowel A, uh, the context of vowel A for most of the sounds, and for the other sounds there were no movement present. And you could see a passive and switch coming forward. Uh, can we play that again? Uh, so you can see a large uh, passive switch which is coming forward here yes and it was not present for other sounds when she saying e u there was uh, no passive switch no contact but then with a the velum was moving back a uh, little uh, slightly and the passive switch is coming closer to the velum and there was a contact so to confirm this uh, so though, though this was a sure case of velopharyngeal dysfunction to confirm this movement we had to do a naso endoscopy for this case so this is her naso endoscopy and uh, we could see the same finding here so there was a circular closure seen with even the lateral walls coming forward but that was also seen only for in the context of vowel a not for other uh, vowels or any other consonants so but the even the movement as we see we saw in uh, lvf it was on the lower border of the velum uh, not the entire velum was lifting lifting up only the end of the velum and the uh, uh, posterior pharyngeal wall compensating for the uh, closure uh, was seen in naso endoscopy so uh, this was a case of a vpi and uh, based on all these findings uh, the management was recommended yeah thank you so there's a question for you is there a growth dependent alteration in velopharyngeal function in repaired palate patients this is for me yes anybody yeah i i i don't think there is um, though yeah, if you listen to uh, professor somalat he sees keep saying this all the time that till the patient is an adult you are not sure whether your patient has velopharyngeal dysfunction or, or not he says the last assessment has to be after growth is completed so he obviously means that it can happen uh, more often i think the worry is like uh, like uh, dr mukund reddy said uh, uh, it's probably uh, as a result of atrophy of the adenoids etc and then the the function of the soft palate not being uh, adequate i i don't know of any studies uh, which show that uh, a person who has reasonably good uh, uh, velopharyngeal function becomes dysfunctional because uh, of um, growth of the face they also remember that the maxilla tend to grow less not normally in most cleft cases so i don't think there is but this is just a speculation i don't have any evidence yeah uh, dr karun is there anything that you want to add yeah there are no i don't want to contradict but uh, the fact remains is uh, it is as uh, dr sumar lat says it remains unpredictable till the age of 18 years that's right. why the long term follow up of this pilot patients can be assessed as a final uh, point of uh, result is at the age of 18 years because even after the adolescence there is a change in the dimension of the maxilla it is there is a change in the dimension of the mandible till the age of 18 years and there may be variation in the velopharyngeal sphincter position and uh, there are uh, there are publications from brazil 
which says that uh, between the age of 13 and 18 years, there is a variation in the velopharyngeal sphincter position in the operated case of death pilot. But they have not been able to say that these were the mild cases earlier and they have become uh, true incompetence. In that series, it's a series of almost 250 patients. And uh, actually, I was part of one of the panel discussion along with that group when they presented the long-term results. And they said that we must assess only at the age of 18 and uh, guarantee that it will not change thereafter. Before that, it is not possible to guarantee. There's a, yeah. Sorry, there's a question. Um, there's a hand raised from Dr. Narayanan. Uh, Sometime back in one of the conferences, Dr. David David presented his whole series from of repaired cleft palate patients over the years. And he did show that some of the children who had very good speech because of the adenoid hypertrophy initially, later on, right. did have a, a regress, a poor, worse speech later on. I think uh, those who attended that uh, would agree. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with you. Some, so that that is why I think when we do any of these procedures, uh, it is it is not enough if we just look at the velar movement. It's important to look for the structures on the posterior pharyngeal wall as well. And if we find that there is an adenoid pad which is facilitating the closure, I think it's important to reassess after a period of time. I I agree with you definitely on that. Um, apart from, apart the, from the adenoid, other, we should also look for the tonsils. There are patients tonsils, where, yes, yes. So it's not only the adenoid which needs to be taken care of, one has to take care of the tonsils. Uh, I could see in some of the video which has been presented, tonsils are very prominently seen. And these patients behave differently when the tonsil involutes in due course of time. And uh, invariably, they will involute by the age of adolescence. And then there will be variation in your VPS position. And then you have to take the call based on the after involution, what is there. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Reddy, if you could take up this question. The other question is, what will be an appropriate time to surgically correct VPD? No appropriate time. You should be done. It should be done as soon as three possible. Years. The earliest I have done is three years. But then the number of uh, patients at that age where you can confidently say they have VPD is small because normally mm -hmm. the, you need to have a reasonable amount of speech for you to confirm subjectively. Then objectively at three years, it's very difficult to you have to take a call based on uh, subjective call alone. But uh, average, I would say in my cases, it's over the age of six years. Because five plus, the patients are cooperative enough to assist. And my current findings are indicate that uh, six or seven years is fine. Because you can, they can revert to normal speech when you do a, a, the surgery. Yeah. Uh, Aparna, uh, what numbers yeah. do... Sorry, sir. Aparna, what, what are our uh, early uh, age uh, surgeries? Are they four to five years? Four, four to five. Four to six Four to six. Yeah, so okay. most assessments are now being done around five years of age. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Actually, if I remember some of the literature, the assessment of these patients are little. Uh, the development of speech is also relatively delayed in cleft delayed. palate patients. Right, sir. Yes. 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 Normal assessment of uh, normal children, the, it is expected that by three, three and a half years, you have got the complete development of speech, mm. most of the normal children. So if it is considered as little delayed uh, in cleft palate, probably by four, four and, uh, four and right. five years of age, we should uh, start assessing. And right. after assessment, we give a speech therapy trial and uh, reassessment and uh, objective assessment that takes another six months or a year. So I think what Dr. Mukund Reddy says and uh, your uh, uh, this Aparna also says, around six years is the uh, five right. and a half, six years is the age when we can think of the earliest uh, surgical intervention. Unless there's a very obvious case where there is a breakdown of the soft palate and there is a large gap, there you can do earlier. Then it is a objective uh, means, then you have got anatomical problems. That is different situation. There you have to strike it much earlier. Mm. 
fistula is there, when there is breakdown mm. is there, when you have got the subsurface cleft palate is there, probably you might have to do it by three years of age or maybe earlier. But when it is right. only VPD assessment and then surgery, when normal palate is there, around five and a half, six years is the uh, good time to say it's a minimum age. So I think I think the biggest challenge is, especially when you're going in for pharyngeal surgeries, if we're looking at surgeries by three years or four years for any of these that we are saying, as long as we are going for the physiological ones, where we're just doing a soft palate re-repair, then the age is definitely not a criteria. And you see a breakdown and we repair it. We don't even need an endoscopy or fluoroscopy in that case. But, but the moment we go in for secondary procedures involving the pharyngeal walls, I think it's very, very important that we do these assessments before we go in for uh, the surgery. I mean, uh, do, do you agree with me on that? Or is there any difference of opinion there? Uh, only, I agree. I fully agree with you. Only difference is uh, when you do the uh, secondary surgery, it may not be only pharyngeal surgery. You might need to do soft palate surgery like furloughs or uh, a redo palatoplasty or uh, radical muscle dissection or the buccal myomucosal flap or something like that. But that for that also you require to assess and then uh, strike the secondary surgery after thorough assessment. Yeah. So we cannot de-link the pharyngoplasty, pharyngeal surgery from the palatal surgery. We should have uh, overall uh, uh, outlook together. We should see all of them in same spectrum and then do it because next uh, next time when we do the webinar in the uh, management probably I'll make it my uh, my point of view more clear that uh, surgical procedures are there which can be palatal as well as the pharyngeal and then we have to take a call on which surgery is good for that particular patient based on the objectivity. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, are there any more questions from the audience? We are crystal clear uh, about our presentations. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, you know, staying back with us, uh, even though we have exceeded the time limit that we said, but it's been, uh, it's been a wonderful session. I enjoyed this experience, and um, it, it's been, the discussions were really, really interesting. Thank you, everyone, for uh, that. Uh, Mamta, over to you. Yeah, so again, echoing um, thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the panelists um, with the videos and the presentations and everyone and to all the participants who actively participated. Um, we hope, we sincerely hope that we were able to clarify uh, some of the points which were so passionately um, you know, delivered by our esteemed panelists. And definitely, uh, please reach out to us either uh, directly or you can reach out to uh, the panelists, Dr. Karun, Dr. Krishnamurti, Dr. Mukund Reddy, Dr. Savita, anyone, feel free to reach out to them either directly or via us. And uh, we will address all your questions and we will make sure that all of them are answered. 